a tempter had shown it to her. It involved a great wrong, which to her had quite obscured its feasibility. But she perceived now that it was indeed a way. Nature was forcing her hand at this game, and to what will not nature compel her weaker victims, in extremes? Louis left her to think it out. When he reached the drawing room Dr. Helmsdale was standing there with the air of a man too good for his destiny, which, to be just to him, was not far from the truth this time. Have you broken my message to her? asked the bishop sonorously. Not your message, your visit, said Louis. I leave the rest in your lordship's hands. I have done all I can for her. She was in her own small room today, and, feeling that it must be a bold stroke or none, he led the bishop across the hall till he reached her apartment and opened the door, but instead of following he shut it behind his visitor. Then Glanville passed an anxious time. He walked from the foot of the staircase to the star of old swords and pikes on the wall, from these to the stag's horns, thence down the corridor as far as the door where he could hear murmuring inside, but not its import. The longer they remained closeted the more excited did he become. That she had not peremptorily negatived the proposal at the outset was a strong sign of its success. It showed that she had admitted argument, and the worthy bishop had a pleader on his side whom he knew little of. The very weather seemed to favour Dr. Helmsdale in his suit. A blusterous wind had blown up from the west, howling in the smokeless chimneys, and suggesting to the feminine mind storms at sea, a tossing ocean, and the hopeless inaccessibility of all astronomers and men on the other side of the same. The bishop had entered Viviette's room at ten minutes past three. The long hand of the hall clock lay level at forty-five minutes past when the knob of the door moved, and he came out. Louis met him where the passage joined the hall. Dr. Helmsdale was decidedly in an emotional state, his face being slightly flushed. Louis looked his anxious inquiry without speaking it. She accepts me, said the bishop in a low voice. And the wedding is to be soon. Her long solitude and sufferings justify haste. What you said was true. Sheer weariness and distraction have driven her to me. She was quite passive at last and agreed to anything I proposed, such is the persuasive force of trained logical reasoning. A good and wise woman, she perceived what a true shelter from sadness was offered in me, and was not the one to despise heaven's gift. XL the silence of Swithin was to be accounted for by the circumstance that neither to the Mediterranean nor to America had he in the first place directed his steps. Feeling himself absolutely free he had, on arriving at Southampton, decided to make straight for the Cape, and hence had not gone aboard the Occidental at all. His object was to leave his heavier luggage there, examine the capabilities of the spot for his purpose, find out the necessity or otherwise of shipping over his own equatorial, and then cross to America as soon as there was a good opportunity. Here he might inquire the movements of the transit expedition to the South Pacific and join it at such a point as might be convenient. Thus, the wrong in her premises, Viviette had intuitively decided with sad precision. There was, 
as a matter of fact, a great possibility of her not being able to communicate with him for several months, notwithstanding that he might possibly communicate with her. This excursive time was an awakening force within. To altered circumstances inevitably followed altered views. That such changes should have a marked effect upon a young man who had made neither grand tour nor petty one, who had, in short, scarcely been away from home in his life, was nothing more than natural. New ideas struggled to disclose themselves and with the addition of strange twinklers to his southern horizon came an absorbed attention that way, and a corresponding forgetfulness of what lay to the north behind his back, whether human or celestial. Whoever may deplore it few will wonder that Viviette, who till then had stood high in his heaven, if she had not dominated it sank, like the North Star, lower and lower with his retreat southward. Master of a large advance of his first year's income in circular notes, he perhaps too readily forgot that the mere act of honour, but for her self-suppression, would have rendered him penniless. Meanwhile, to come back and claim her at the specified time, four years thence, if she should not object to be claimed, was as much a part of his program as were the exploits abroad and elsewhere that were to prelude it. The very thoroughness of his intention for that advanced date inclined him all the more readily to shelve the subject now. Her unhappy caution to him not to write too soon was a comfortable license in his present state of tension about sublime scientific things, which knew not woman, nor her sacrifices, nor her fears. In truth he was not only too young in years, but too literal, direct, and uncompromising in nature to understand such a woman as Lady Constantine, and she suffered for that limitation in him as it had been antecedently probable that she would do. He stayed but a little time at Cape Town on this his first reconnoitering journey, and on that account wrote to no one from the place. On leaving he found there remained some weeks on his hands before he wished to cross to America, and feeling an irrepressible desire for further studies in navigation on shipboard, and under clear skies, he took the steamer for Melbourne, returning thence in due time, and pursuing his journey to America, where he landed at Boston. Having at last had enough of great circles and other nautical reckonings, and taking no interest in men or cities, this indefatigable scrutineer of the universe went immediately on to Cambridge, and there, by the help of an introduction he had brought from England, he revelled for a time in the glories of the gigantic refractor, which he was permitted to use on occasion and in the pleasures of intercourse with the scientific group around. This brought him on to the time of starting with the transit expedition, when he and his kind became lost to the eye of civilization behind the horizon of the Pacific Ocean. To speak of their doings on this pilgrimage, of ingress and egress, of tangent and parallax, of external and internal contact, would avail nothing. Is it not all written in the chronicles of the Astronomical Society? More to the point will it be to mention that Viviette's letter to Cambridge had been returned long before he reached that place, while her missive to Marseilles was, of course, misdirected altogether. On arriving in America, Uncertain of an address in that country at which he would stay long, Swithin wrote his first letter to his grandmother, 
and in this he ordered that all communications should be sent to await him at Cape Town, as the only safe spot for finding him, sooner or later. The equatorial he also directed to be forwarded to the same place. At this time, too, he ventured to break Viviette's commands, and address a letter to her not knowing of the strange results that had followed his absence from home. It was February. The transit was over, the scientific company had broken up, and Swithin had steamed towards the Cape to take up his permanent abode there, with a view to his great task of surveying, charting and theorizing on those exceptional features in the southern skies which had been but partially treated by the younger Herschel. Having entered Table Bay and landed on the quay, he called at once at the post office. Two letters were handed him, and he found from the date that they had been waiting there for some time. One of these epistles, which had a weather-worn look as regarded the ink, and was in old-fashioned penmanship, he knew to be from his grandmother. He opened it before he had as much as glanced at the superscription of the second. Besides immaterial portions, it contained the following, J. Reckon you know by now of our main news this fall, but lest you should not have heard of it Jay send the exact thing snipped out of the newspaper. Nobody expected her to do it quite so soon, but it is said here about that my Lord Bishop and my Lady had been drawing nigh to an understanding before the glum tidings of Sir Blount's taking of his own life reached her and the account of this wicked deed was so sore afflicting to her mind, and made her poor heart so timid and low, that in charity to my lady her few friends agreed on urging her to let the bishop go on paying his court as before, notwithstanding she had not been a widow woman. Near so long as was thought. This, as it turned out, she was willing to do and when my lord asked her she told him she would marry him at once or never. That's as Jay was told, and Jay had it from those that know. The cutting from the newspaper was an ordinary announcement of marriage between the Bishop of Melchester and Lady Constantine. Swithin was so astounded at the intelligence of what for the nonce seemed Viviette's wanton fickleness that he quite omitted to look at the second letter, and remembered nothing about it till an hour afterwards, when sitting in his own room at the hotel. It was in her handwriting, but so altered that its superscription had not arrested his eye. It had no beginning or date, but its contents soon acquainted him with her motive for the precipitate act. The few concluding sentences are all that it will be necessary to quote here, there was no way out of it, even if I could have found you, without infringing one of the conditions I had previously laid down. The long desire of my heart has been not to impoverish you or mar your career. The new desire was to save myself and, still more, another yet unborn. I have done a desperate thing. Yet for myself I could do no better, and for you no less. I would have sacrificed my single self to honesty but I was not alone concerned. What woman has a right to blight a coming life to preserve her personal integrity? The one bright spot is that it saves you and your endowment from further catastrophes, and preserves you to the pleasant paths of scientific fame. I no longer lie like a log across your path which is now as open as on the day before you saw me, 
and ere I encouraged you to win me. Alas, Swithin, I ought to have known better. The folly was great, and the suffering be upon my head. I ought not to have consented to that last interview, all was well till then. Well, I have borne much, and am not unprepared. As for you, Swithin, by simply pressing straight on your triumph is assured. Do not communicate with me in any way, not even in answer to this. Do not think of me. Do not see me ever any more. Dot, your unhappy Viviet. Swithin's heart swelled within him in sudden pity for her, first, then he blanched with a horrified sense of what she had done, and at his own relation to the deed. He felt like an awakened somnambulist who should find that he had been accessory to a tragedy during his unconsciousness. She had loosened the knot of her difficulties by cutting it unscrupulously through and through. The big tidings rather dazed than crushed him, his predominant feeling being soon again one of keenest sorrow and sympathy. Yet one thing was obvious, he could do nothing, absolutely nothing. The event which he now heard of for the first time had taken place five long months ago. He reflected, and regretted, and mechanically went on with his preparations for settling down to work under the shadow of Table Mountain. He was as one who suddenly finds the world a stranger place than he thought, but is excluded by age, temperament and situation from being much more than an astonished spectator of its strangeness. Asterisk 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 the Royal Observatory was about a mile out of the town, and hither he repaired as soon as he had established himself in lodgings. He had decided, on his first visit to the Cape, that it would be highly advantageous to him if he could supplement the occasional use of the large instruments here by the use at his own house of his own equatorial, and had accordingly given directions that it might be sent over from England. The precious possession now arrived, and although the sight of it, of the brasses on which her hand had often rested, of the eyepiece through which her dark eyes had beamed, engendered some decidedly bitter regrets in him for a time, he could not long afford to give to the past the days that were meant for the future. Unable to get a room convenient for a private observatory he resolved at last to fix the instrument on a solid pillar in the garden and several days were spent in accommodating it to its new position. In this latitude there was no necessity for economizing clear nights as he had been obliged to do on the old tower at Welland. There it had happened more than once, that after waiting idle through days and nights of cloudy weather, Viviette would fix her time for meeting him at an hour when at last he had an opportunity of seeing the sky, so that in giving to her the golden moments of cloudlessness he was losing his chance with the orbs above. Those features which usually attract the eye of the visitor to a new latitude are the novel forms of human and vegetable life, and other such sublunary things. But the young man glanced slightingly at these, the changes overhead had all his attention. The old subject was imprinted there, but in a new type. Here was a heaven, fixed and ancient as the northern, yet it had never appeared above the Welland Hills since they were heaved up from beneath. Here was an unalterable circumpolar region but the polar patterns stereotyped in history and legend, 
without which it had almost seemed that a polar sky could not exist, had never been seen therein. Saint Cleve, as was natural, began by cursory surveys, which were not likely to be of much utility to the world or to himself. He wasted several weeks, indeed above two months, in a comparatively idle survey of southern novelties, in the mere luxury of looking at stellar objects whose wonders were known, recounted, and classified, long before his own personality had been heard of. With a child's simple delight he allowed his instrument to rove, evening after evening from the gorgeous glitter of Canopus to the hazy clouds of Magellan. Before he had well finished this optical prelude there floated over to him from the other side of the equator the postscript to the epistle of his lost Viviette. It came in the vehicle of a common newspaper, under the head of births, April 10, 18- at the palace, Melchester the wife of the Bishop of Melchester, of a son. XLI three years passed away, and Swithin still remained at the Cape, quietly pursuing the work that had brought him there. His memoranda of observations had accumulated to a wheelbarrow load, and he was beginning to shape them into a treatise which should possess some scientific utility. He had gauged the southern skies with greater results than even he himself had anticipated. Those unfamiliar constellations which, to the casual beholder, are at most a new arrangement of ordinary points of light, were to this professed astronomer, as to his brethren, a far greater matter. It was below the surface that his material lay. There, in regions revealed only to the instrumental observer, were suns of hybrid kind, fire fogs, floating nuclei, globes that flew in groups like swarms of bees, and other extraordinary sights, which, when decomposed by Swithin's equatorial, turned out to be the beginning of a new series of phenomena instead of the end of an old one. There were gloomy deserts in those southern skies such as the north shows scarcely an example of, sites set apart for the position of suns which for some unfathomable reason were left uncreated, their places remaining ever since conspicuous by their emptiness. The inspection of these chasms brought him a second pulsation of that old horror which he had used to describe to Viviette as produced in him by bottomlessness in the north heaven. The ghostly finger of limitless vacancy touched him now on the other side. Infinite deeps in the north stellar region had a homely familiarity about them when compared with infinite deeps in the region of the South Pole. This was an even more unknown tract of the unknown. Space here, being less the historic haunt of human thought than overhead at home, seemed to be pervaded with a more lonely loneliness. Were there given on paper to these astronomical excitations of St. Cleve a space proportionable to that occupied by his year with Viviette at Welland, this narrative would treble its length, but not a single additional glimpse would be afforded of Swithin in his relations with old emotions. In these experiments with tubes and glasses, Important as they were to human intellect, there was little food for the sympathetic instincts which create the changes in a life. That which is the foreground and measuring base of one perspective draft may be the vanishing point of another perspective draft, while yet they are both drafts of the same thing. Swithin's doings and discoveries in the southern cider eel system were, no doubt, 
incidents of the highest importance to him, and yet from an intersocial point of view they served but the humble purpose of killing time, while other doings, more nearly allied to his heart than to his understanding, developed themselves at home. In the intervals between his professional occupations he took walks over the sand flats near, or among the farms which were gradually overspreading the country in the vicinity of Cape Town. He grew familiar with the outline of Table Mountain, and the fleecy devil's tablecloth which used to settle on its top when the wind was southeast. On these promenades he would more particularly think of Viviette, and of that curious pathetic chapter in his life with her which seemed to have wound itself up and ended forever. Those scenes were rapidly receding into distance, and the intensity of his sentiment regarding them had proportionately abated. He felt that there had been something wrong therein and yet he could not exactly define the boundary of the wrong. Viviette's sad and amazing sequel to that chapter had still a fearful, catastrophic aspect in his eyes, but instead of musing over it and its bearings he shunned the subject, as we shun by night the shady scene of a disaster, and keep to the open road. He sometimes contemplated her apart from the past, leading her life in the cathedral close at Melchester, and wondered how often she looked south and thought of where he was. On one of these afternoon walks in the neighborhood of the Royal Observatory he turned and gazed towards the signal post on the lion's rump. This was a high promontory to the northwest of Table Mountain, and overlooked Table Bay. Before his eyes had left the scene the signal was suddenly hoisted on the staff. It announced that a mail steamer had appeared in view over the sea. In the course of an hour he retraced his steps, as he had often done on such occasions and strolled leisurely across the intervening mile and a half till he arrived at the post office door. There was no letter from England for him, but there was a newspaper, addressed in the 17th century handwriting of his grandmother, who, in spite of her great age, still retained a steady hold on life. He turned away disappointed, and resumed his walk into the country, opening the paper as he went along. A cross in black ink attracted his attention, and it was opposite a name among the deaths. His blood ran icily as he discerned the words the palace, Melchester. But it was not she. Her husband, the Bishop of Melchester, had after a short illness, departed this life at the comparatively early age of fifty years. All the enactments of the bygone days at Welland now started up like an awakened army from the ground. But a few months were wanting to the time when he would be of an age to marry without sacrificing the annuity which formed his means of subsistence. It was a point in his life that had had no meaning or interest for him since his separation from Viviette, for women were now no more to him than the inhabitants of Jupiter. But the whirligig of time having again set Viviette free, the aspect of home altered, and conjecture as to her future found room to work anew. But beyond the simple fact that she was a widow he for some time gained not an atom of intelligence concerning her. There was no one of whom he could inquire but his grandmother, and she could tell him nothing about a lady who dwelled far away at Melchester. Several months slipped by thus, 
and no feeling within him rose to sufficient strength to force him out of a passive attitude. Then by the merest chance his granny stated in one of her rambling epistles that Lady Constantine was coming to live again at Welland in the old house, with her child, now a little boy between three and four years of age. Swithin, however, lived on as before. But by the following autumn a change became necessary for the young man himself. His work at the Cape was done. His uncle's wishes that he should study there had been more than observed. The materials for his great treatise were collected, and it now only remained for him to arrange, digest, and publish them, for which purpose a return to England was indispensable. So the equatorial was unscrewed and the stand taken down, the astronomer's barrow load of precious memoranda, and rolls upon rolls of diagrams, representing three years of continuous labor, were safely packed, and Swithin departed for good and all from the shores of Cape Town. He had long before informed his grandmother of the date at which she might expect him, and in a reply from her, which reached him just previous to sailing, she casually mentioned that she frequently saw Lady Constantine, that on the last occasion her ladyship had shown great interest in the information that Swithin was coming home, and had inquired the time of his return. Asterisk 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 on a late summer day Swithin stepped from the train at Warborne, and, directing his baggage to be sent on after him, set out on foot for Old Welland once again. It seemed but the day after his departure, so little had the scene changed. True. There was that change which is always the first to arrest attention in places that are conventionally called unchanging, a higher and broader vegetation at every familiar corner than at the former time. He had not gone a mile when he saw walking before him a clergyman whose form, after consideration, he recognized in spite of a novel whiteness in that part of his hair that showed below the brim of his hat. Swithin walked much faster than this gentleman, and soon was at his side. Mr. Talkingham. I knew it was said Swithin. Mr. Talkingham was slower in recognizing the astronomer, but in a moment had greeted him with a warm shake of the hand. I have been to the station on purpose to meet you, cried Mr. Talkingham, and was returning with the idea that you had not come. I am your grandmother's emissary. She could not come herself, and as she was anxious, and nobody else could be spared, I came for her. Then they walked on together. The parson told Swithin all about his grandmother, the parish, and his endeavours to enlighten it, and in due course said, You are no doubt aware that Lady Constantine is living again at Welland. Swithin said he had heard as much, and added, what was far within the truth, that the news of the bishop's death had been a great surprise to him. Yes, said Mr. Talkingham, with nine thoughts to one word. One might have prophesied, to look at him, that Melchester would not lack a bishop for the next forty years. Yes, pale death knocks at the cottages of the poor and the palaces of kings with an impartial foot. Was he a particularly good man? asked Swithin. He was not a Ken or a Heber. To speak candidly, he had his faults, of which arrogance was not the least. But who is perfect? 
depths within, somehow, felt relieved to hear that the bishop was not a perfect man. His poor wife, I fear, had not a great deal more happiness with him than with her first husband. But one might almost have foreseen it. The marriage was hasty, the result of a red-hot caprice, hardly becoming in a man of his position, and it betokened a want of temperate discretion which soon showed itself in other ways. That's all there was to be said against him, and now it's all over, and things have settled again into their old course. But the bishop's widow is not the Lady Constantine of former days. No, put it as you will, she is not the same. There seems to be a nameless something on her mind, a trouble, a rooted melancholy which no man's ministry can reach. Formerly she was a woman whose confidence it was easy to gain, but neither religion nor philosophy avails with her now. Beyond that, her life is strangely like what it was when you were with us. Conversing thus they pursued the turnpike road till their conversation was interrupted by a crying voice on their left. They looked, and perceived that a child, in getting over an adjoining stile, had fallen on his face. Mr. Talkingham and Swithin both hastened up to help the sufferer, who was a lovely little fellow with flaxen hair, which spread out in a frill of curls from beneath a quaint, close-fitting velvet cap that he wore. Swithin picked him up while Mr. Talkingham wiped the sand from his lips and nose, and administered a few words of consolation, together with a few sweet meats, which, somewhat to Swithin's surprise, the parson produced as if by magic from his pocket. One half the comfort rendered would have sufficed to soothe such a disposition as the child's. He ceased crying and ran away in delight to his unconscious nurse, who was reaching up for blackberries at a hedge some way off. You know who he is, of course, said Mr. Talkingham, as they resumed their journey. No, said Swithin. Oh, I thought you did. Yet how should you? It is Lady Constantine's boy her only child. His fond mother little thinks he is so far away from home. Dear me, Lady Constantine's, ah, how interesting. Swithin paused abstractedly for a moment, then stepped back again to the stile, while he stood watching the little boy out of sight. I can never venture out of doors now without sweets in my pocket continued the good-natured vicar, and the result is that I meet that young man more frequently on my rounds than any other of my parishioners. St. Cleve was silent, and they turned into Welland Lane, where their paths presently diverged, and Swithin was left to pursue his way alone. He might have accompanied the vicar yet further, and gone straight to Welland House, but it would have been difficult to do so then without provoking inquiry. It was easy to go there now, by a cross path he could be at the mansion almost as soon as by the direct road. And yet Swithin did not turn, he felt an indescribable reluctance to see Viviette. He could not exactly say why. True, before he knew how the land lay it might be awkward to attempt to call, and this was a sufficient excuse for postponement. In this mood he went on, following the direct way to his grandmother's homestead. He reached the garden gate, and, looking into the bosky basin where the old house stood, saw a graceful female form moving before the porch, 
bidding adieu to someone within the door. He wondered what creature of that mould his grandmother could know, and went forward with some hesitation. At his approach the apparition turned, and he beheld, developed into blushing womanhood, one who had once been known to him as the village maiden Tabitha Lark. Seeing Swithin, and apparently from an instinct that her presence would not be desirable just then, she moved quickly round into the garden. The returned traveller entered the house, where he found awaiting him poor old Mrs. Martin, to whose earthly course death stood rather as the asymptote than as the end. She was perceptibly smaller in form than when he had left her, and she could see less distinctly. A rather affecting greeting followed, in which his grandmother murmured the words of Israel, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. The form of Hannah had disappeared from the kitchen that ancient servant having been gathered to her father's about six months before, her place being filled by a young girl who knew not Joseph. They presently chatted with much cheerfulness, and his grandmother said, Have you heard what a wonderful young woman Miss Lark has become, a mere fleet-footed, slittering maid when you were last home? Saint Cleve had not heard, but he had partly seen, and he was informed that Tabitha had left Welland shortly after his own departure, and had studied music with great success in London, where she had resided ever since till quite recently, that she played at concerts, oratorios, had, in short, joined the phalanx of wonderful women who had resolved to eclipse masculine genius altogether, and humiliate the brutal sex to the dust. She is only in the garden added his grandmother. Why don't ye go out and speak to her? Swithin was nothing lote, and strolled out under the apple trees where he arrived just in time to prevent Miss Lark from going off by the back gate. There was not much difficulty in breaking the ice between them, and they began to chat with vivacity. Now all these proceedings occupied time, for somehow it was very charming to talk to Miss Lark and by degrees St. Cleve informed Tabitha of his great undertaking and of the voluminous notes he had amassed, which would require so much rearrangement and recopying by an amanuensis as to absolutely appall him. He greatly feared he should not get one careful enough for such scientific matter, whereupon Tabitha said she would be delighted to do it for him. Then blushing, and declaring suddenly that it had grown quite late, she left him and the garden for her relations' house hard by. Swithin, no less than Tabitha, had been surprised by the disappearance of the sun behind the hill, and the question now arose whether it would be advisable to call upon Viviette that night. There was little doubt that she knew of his coming but more than that he could not predicate, and being entirely ignorant of whom she had around her, entirely in the dark as to her present feelings towards him, he thought it would be better to defer his visit until the next day. Walking round to the front of the house he beheld the well-known agriculturists Hezzy Biles, Hamus Fry, and some others of the same old school, passing the gate homeward from their work with bundles of wood at their backs. Swithin saluted them over the top rail. Well, do my eyes and ears, began Hezzy, and then, balancing his faggot on end against the hedge, he came forward, the others following. 
says I to myself as soon as I hear it. His voice has he continued, addressing Swithin as if he were a disinterested spectator and not himself. Please God I'll pitch my niche, and go across and speak to E.N. I knowed in a winking twas some great navigator that I see a standing there said Hamus. But we are to a sort of nabob, or a diamond digger, or a lion hunter, I couldn't so much as guess till I hear a D.N. speak. And what changes have come over Welland since I was last at home, asked Swithin. Well, Mr. San Cleve has he replied, when you've said that a few stripling boys and maidens have busted into Bluth, and a few married women have plimmed and chimped, my lady among em, why, you've said anized all, Mr. San Cleve. The conversation thus began was continued on divers matters till they were all enveloped in total darkness, when his old acquaintances shouldered their faggots again and proceeded on their way. Now that he was actually within her coasts again Swithin felt a little more strongly the influence of the past and Viviette than he had been accustomed to do for the last two or three years. During the night he felt half sorry that he had not marched off to the great house to see her, regardless of the time of day. If she really nourished for him any particle of her old affection it had been the cruelest thing not to call. A few questions that he put concerning her to his grandmother elicited that Lady Constantine had no friends about her not even her brother, and that her health had not been so good since her return from Melchester as formerly. Still, this proved nothing as to the state of her heart, and as she had kept a dead silence since the bishop's death it was quite possible that she would meet him with that cold repressive tone and manner which experienced women know so well how to put on when they wish to intimate to the long-lost lover that old episodes are to be taken as forgotten. The next morning he prepared to call if only on the ground of old acquaintance, for Swithin was too straightforward to ascertain anything indirectly. It was rather too early for this purpose when he went out from his grandmother's garden gate, after breakfast, and he waited in the garden. While he lingered his eye fell on Rings Hill Spear. It appeared dark, for a moment against the blue sky behind it, then the fleeting cloud which shadowed it passed on, and the face of the column brightened into such luminousness that the sky behind sank to the complexion of a dark foil. Surely somebody is on the column he said to himself, after gazing at it a while. Instead of going straight to the great house he deviated through the insulating field, now sown with turnips, which surrounded the plantation on Rings Hill. By the time that he plunged under the trees he was still more certain that somebody was on the tower. He crept up to the base with proprietary curiosity, for the spot seemed again like his own. The path still remained much as formerly, but the nook in which the cabin had stood was covered with undergrowth. Swithin entered the door of the tower, ascended the staircase about halfway on tiptoe, and listened, for he did not wish to intrude on the top if any stranger were there. The hollow spiral, as he knew from old experience, would bring down to his ears the slightest sound from above, and it now revealed to him the words of a duologue in progress at the summit of the tower. Mother, what shall I do, a child's voice said. Shall I sing? The mother seemed to assent, for the child began, 
the robin has fled from the wood to the snug habitation of man. This performance apparently attracted but little attention from the child's companion, for the young voice suggested, as a new form of entertainment, shall I say my prayers? Yes, replied one whom Swithin had begun to recognize. Who shall I pray for? No answer. Who shall I pray for? Pray for father. But he is gone to heaven. A sigh from Viviette was distinctly audible. You made a mistake, didn't you, mother, continued the little one. I must have. The strangest mistake a woman ever made. Nothing more was said, and Swithin ascended, words from above indicating to him that his footsteps were heard. In another half minute he rose through the hatchway. A lady in black was sitting in the sun, and the boy with the flaxen hair whom he had seen yesterday was at her feet. Viviette, he said. Swithin, at last, she cried. The words died upon her lips, and from very faintness she bent her head. For instead of rushing forward to her he had stood still, and there appeared upon his face a look which there was no mistaking. Yes, he was shocked at her worn and faded aspect. The image he had mentally carried out with him to the cape he had brought home again as that of the woman he was now to rejoin. But another woman sat before him, and not the original Viviette. Her cheeks had lost forever that firm contour which had been drawn by the vigorous hand of youth, and the masses of hair that were once darkness visible had become touched here and there by a faint grey haze, like the violacte in a midnight sky. Yet to those who had eyes to understand as well as to see, the chastened pensiveness of her once handsome features revealed more promising material beneath than ever her youth had done. But Swithin was hopelessly her junior. Unhappily for her he had now just arrived at an age whose canon of faith it is that the silly period of woman's life is her only period of beauty. Viviette saw it all and knew that time had at last brought about his revenge. She had tremblingly watched and waited without sleep, ever since Swithin had re-entered Welland, and it was for this. Swithin came forward, and took her by the hand, which she passively allowed him to do. Swithin, you don't love me she said simply. Oh Viviette! You don't love me, she repeated. Don't say it. Yes, but I will, you have a right not to love me. You did once. But now I am an old woman, and you are still a young man, so how can you love me? I do not expect it. It is kind and charitable of you to come and see me here. I have come all the way from the Cape he faltered, for her insistence took all power out of him to deny in mere politeness what she said. Yes, you have come from the Cape, but not for me she answered. It would be absurd if you had come for me. You have come because your work there is finished. I like to sit here with my little boy. It is a pleasant spot. It was once something to us, was it not? But that was long ago. You scarcely knew me for the same woman, did you? Knew you, yes, of course I knew you. You looked as if you did not. But you must not be surprised at me. I belong to an earlier generation than you, remember. 
thus, in sheer bitterness of spirit did she inflict wounds on herself by exaggerating the difference in their years. But she had nevertheless spoken truly. Sympathies with her as he might, and as he unquestionably did, he loved her no longer. But why had she expected otherwise? A woman might a prophet have said to her, Great is thy faith if thou believest a junior lover's love will last five years. I shall be glad to know through your grandmother how you are getting on she said meekly. But now I would much rather that we part. Yes, do not question me. I would rather that we part. Goodbye. Hardly knowing what he did he touched her hand, and obeyed. He was a scientist, and took words literally. There is something in the inexorably simple logic of such men which partakes of the cruelty of the natural laws that are their study. He entered the tower steps, and mechanically descended, and it was not till he got halfway down that he thought she could not mean what she had said. Before leaving Cape Town he had made up his mind on this one point that if she were willing to marry him, marry her he would without let or hindrance. That much he morally owed her, and was not the man to demur. And though the Swithin who had returned was not quite the Swithin who had gone away, though he could not now love her with the sort of love he had once bestowed, he believed that all her conduct had been dictated by the purest benevolence to him, by that charity which seeketh not her own. Hence he did not flinch from a wish to deal with loving kindness towards her, a sentiment perhaps in the long run more to be prized than lover's love. Her manner had caught him unawares but now recovering himself he turned back determinedly. Bursting out upon the roof he clasped her in his arms, and kissed her several times. Viviette, Viviette he said, I have come to marry you. She uttered a shriek, a shriek of amazed joy, such as never was heard on that tower before or since, and fell in his arms clasping his neck. There she lay heavily. Not to disturb her he sat down in her seat, still holding her fast. Their little son, who had stood with round conjectural eyes throughout the meeting, now came close, and presently looking up to Swithin said, Mother has gone to sleep. Swithin looked down, and started. Her tight clasp had loosened. A wave of whiteness, like that of marble which had never seen the sun, crept up from her neck, and travelled upwards and onwards over her cheek, lips, eyelids, forehead, temples, its margin banishing back the live pink till the latter had entirely disappeared. Seeing that something was wrong, Yet not understanding what, the little boy began to cry, but in his concentration Swithin hardly heard it. Viviette, Viviette, he said. The child cried with still deeper grief, and, after a momentary hesitation, pushed his hand into Swithin's for protection. Hush, hush. My child said Swithin distractedly. I'll take care of you. Oh Viviette, he exclaimed again, pressing her face to his. But she did not reply. What can this be, he asked himself. He would not then answer according to his fear. He looked up for help. Nobody appeared in sight but Tabitha Lark, who was skirting the field with a bounding tread, 
the single bright spot of color and animation within the wide horizon. When he looked down again his fear deepened to certainty. It was no longer a mere surmise that help was vain. Sudden joy after despair had touched an overstrained heart too smartly. Viviette was dead. The bishop was avenged. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook 2 on a tower asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special Rules Set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by US copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start Full license the full project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works. By using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase project Gutenberg. You agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 by reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. 
There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1 1 1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, 
the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns.
Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy. If a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work, you comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9 if you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement, Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, 
you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity You agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. a. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. b. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and c. Any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001 the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help. See sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3. 
educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116. 801-596-1887 Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4 Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements. We know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5 General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, 
we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.